This is Michael Altos recording Autonomic Nervous System Part 1, focusing on physiology and neurotransmitters and cholinergic drugs. The autonomic nervous system is really the point where physiology and pharmacology meet. And therefore, an understanding of the autonomic nervous system is really crucial to understanding the pharmacology of so many anesthetic drugs. For that reason, we're going to spend some time reviewing the autonomic nervous system, even though you've certainly been exposed to it in the physiology course as well. The autonomic nervous system is the part of our nervous system which regulates cardiac and smooth muscle, and those would be muscles that might be found, for example, in blood vessels as well as the function of the viscera, which are the different organs and glands. The autonomic nervous system controls subconscious functions and reflexes. It's the involuntary system. It also influences the homeostasis of virtually every tissue and organ system in the human body. And most incredibly, this is accomplished using only three simple substances, three neurotransmitters. The autonomic nervous system can be categorized in different ways. Most commonly, it's categorized into the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. The sympathetic system, also called the adrenergic, named after adrenaline, which is another word for epinephrine, and the parasympathetic system, also known as the cholinergic, named after acetylcholine. Both of these systems are tonically active, which means that they have a baseline activity at rest. And so that activity can increase or decrease. And so we see each of the two systems has more than one way it can move. The system can become more active or less active. And since the two systems are roughly in opposition to each other, the body has more than one way to accomplish an effect with a lot of precision. We can also organize the autonomic nervous system perhaps into the central and the peripheral nervous system. The central nervous system, the CNS, being the principal site of where the brain is organized, and as far as the autonomic system is concerned, this occurs a lot in the hypothalamus and the brainstem, as well as in the spinal cord. The vagus nerve, which is cranial nerve 10, transmits almost all of the sensory input from the thoracic and abdominal organs and sends all of that information to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is responsible for regulating heart rate, blood pressure, the entire GI system, regulation of temperature, hunger, thirst, serum osmolarity, and secretions from glands. For example, the baroreceptor reflex, which senses blood pressure, is mediated through the autonomic nervous system. Emotional responses like blushing and fainting and anxiety are also mediated through the autonomic nervous system. That's all the central nervous system. There's also a peripheral nervous system, which is really the efferent, that is the exiting or the motor component of the system. And in the autonomic system, these efferents are composed of a two neuron unit. The first neuron originates in the central nervous system and exits from the spinal cord and terminates in a ganglion. And the second neuron originates in the ganglion, it synapses with the first neuron, and proceeds out to the target organ. We can compare this with somatic nerves, with regular, uh, let's say, nerves that control our muscles. And these are single axons which have their cell body in the spinal cord, and there's no ganglion involved. So that's a brief overview of the system, and this is one of my favorite pictures in all of autonomic nervous system physiology. And right now, we're just going to focus on a few of the rough points here. So we see a brain stem schematic here with a brain stem and a spinal cord. We see preganglionic fibers in green. We see them synapsing in some sort of a ganglion. And then the second postganglionic fiber going to target vessels. And that's all we have to say about this picture for now, but we will come back to it again a little bit later. If you have any questions, be sure to jot them down and bring them to class, or you can drop me an email and we can discuss them.
First, we're going to talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, also known as the cholinergic system. Some have called it the rest and digest system. So from an evolutionary standpoint, this would be the system in place when, a, uh, when an organism is not under threat, and when it's resting, it's able to focus on homeostatic mechanisms like digesting food. It's also known as the cranial sacral system because the fibers for the parasympathetic system originate from the cranial and from the sacral components of the spinal cord. As we said before, the 10th cranial nerve, vagus nerve, accounts for more than three quarters of all parasympathetic fibers. In general, the preganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system originate in the brainstem or in the sacral segments of the spinal cord. The ganglia of the parasympathetic nervous system are far away from the spinal cord, usually in or near the target organ. The ratio of preganglionic to postganglionic fibers in the human body is close to one to one, which means that the effects of the parasympathetic system tend to be pretty discrete and localized. This is in comparison with the sympathetic system, which we will see in a few moments, where you have one preganglionic fiber synapsing with 10 or 20 or 30 postganglionic fibers, so that a single preganglionic fiber can cause a mass discharge. This effect does not exist in the parasympathetic system. As we said, it's the cholinergic system because the neurotransmitter being released at the effector tissues is acetylcholine. And then as we saw with the neuromuscular junction, so too in the parasympathetic system, that acetylcholine is removed from the vicinity of the receptor by the enzyme acetylcholinesterase. And this occurs in a very short time frame of less than one millisecond. Now we're going to talk about the sympathetic nervous system. This is the adrenergic system, also known as the fight or flight response. The system is also called the thoracolumbar system, and at this point we can look at a picture of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems. Here in blue we have the sympathetic system, I'm sorry, in blue we have the parasympathetic system originating from the cranial nerves and from the sacral nerves. In red we have the sympathetic nervous system originating from the thoracic and lumbar region. The preganglionic fibers, as we can see, are much shorter. They originate from the spinal cord and come to the sympathetic ganglia. And there are many different kinds of sympathetic ganglia. Most of them are in a paravertebral sympathetic ganglionic chain. And this is paired, which means there's one on the left and one on the right. And in a dissection, uh, you can actually see these ganglia as little pearly white balls uh, resting near the spinal cord. Each preganglionic fiber can synapse with a number of different things in the ganglion. It can synapse with a postganglionic neuron which is at the same level, or the fibers can course up and down the ganglionic chain and synapse in a different ganglion in a different level. There are other ganglia besides the paravertebral sympathetic chain. There are sympathetic ganglia like the celiac plexus and the inferior mesenteric plexus. These are unpaired single ganglia. And there are also special paired ganglia, usually up in the T1 to T4 region. And these are things like the superior cervical ganglion, the stellate ganglion, and so on. This is just showing in more detail the idea that uh, nerves can come to the ganglion and then course up or down the chain or synapse in the same ganglion and then send postganglionic fibers out to uh, an end organ. We also see some nerves bypassing the paravertebral ganglia, uh, ganglia and instead synapsing in one of the special ganglia. We said the, synap the sympathetic system is called the thoracolumbar system. And some features of this, as we said, are the, the ganglia are generally closer to the spinal cord than to the target organ. 
And there is an exception to this. This would be the adrenal gland. Preganglionic fibers go directly to the adrenal gland. In fact, you could almost say that the adrenal gland is like a ganglion in itself, except that there is no postganglionic neuron. Instead, there are adrenochromaffin cells, and when the adrenal gland is stimulated, these cells release epinephrine and norepinephrine, uh, not into another nerve, but actually into the circulation. Aside from that one exception, the postganglionic fibers originate in sympathetic ganglia and proceed to the effector tissues, the, the target organs. They travel within spinal nerves, typically, and the postganglionic fibers outnumber the preganglionic fibers by a ratio of 20 or 30 to 1, which means that many different organs can be stimulated at once with an input coming from a single preganglionic fiber. And this is sometimes called a mass sympathetic discharge. Sometimes I think of it as if you're driving down the highway too fast and suddenly in your rearview mirror you see the police car turn on their flashlights, their, their flashers, and suddenly they start to pull over the car next to you. And as you drive away and suddenly every part of your body feels this tremendous discharge. And that's like a sympathetic discharge, that moment when you feel every organ in your body responding to a stressful stimulus. The primary neurotransmitter of the sympathetic nervous system is norepinephrine. There are some exceptions. Sweat glands are activated by acetylcholine, and the adrenal medulla, as we said, secretes norepinephrine and epinephrine. So, in general, we could say that both epi and norepi are neurotransmitters of the s sympathetic system, but norepinephrine is definitely the primary neurotransmitter. I just want to take a very brief moment and mention the uh, synthesis of all of the different catecholamines. Phenylalanine, which is an amino acid, is the precursor to all of the different catecholamines. Phenylalanine is metabolized into tyrosine, which is then met metabolized into something called DOPA. This occurs by an enzyme called tyrosine hydroxylase, and this is actually the rate-limiting step of this process. DOPA is then metabolized into dopamine, which is metabolized into norepinephrine, and norepinephrine causes negative feedback at the tyrosine hydroxylase, and so this is a negative feedback loop. And finally, norepinephrine is converted into epinephrine. This isn't something you need to memorize, at least not for my class, but it gives you a sense of how all of the catecholamines are related. What happens to these catecholamines when they're secreted uh, in the synapse? Well, pretty much all of the and norepinephrine undergoes reuptake back into the presynaptic terminal. In fact, as we will see next semester, there are certain drugs that capitalize on this. For example, tricyclic antidepressants or cocaine inhibit the reuptake of norepinephrine, and people, as a result, will have high levels of circulating norepinephrine. The norepinephrine is eventually metabolized by an enzyme called monoamine oxidase, another enzyme we'll discuss next semester. The metabolism of catecholamines occurs in the liver, and then excretion occurs in the kidney. In addition to monoamine oxidase, the other common enzyme is COMT, which is catechol o methyltransferlase This is significant because the metabolite is called vanilla mandelic acid, or VMA. This is a substance which is secreted in the urine and can also be often be used in the diagnosis of a pheochromocytoma. I also want to remind you that catecholamines that are secreted into the circulation have a longer duration of action than catecholamines that are secreted in the synapse between two neurons. So when we secrete catecholamines into the circulation, that epinephrine usually lasts for minutes versus the epinephrine or norepinephrine that's secreted between neurons, which lasts only for milliseconds. So just to clarify one more time, we've said that endogenous catecholamines undergo reuptake, 
whereas circulating catecholamines, those that make it into the bloodstream, have to go and be metabolized. What are the endogenous catecholamines? So we've already mentioned epinephrine and norepinephrine. The third is dopamine, and we saw all three of those in the, syn in the chain of synthesis. They all have sympathetic activity. Dopamine is a neurotransmitter in the central nervous system. Norepinephrine is synthesized and stored in the postganglionic neurons and in the adrenal medulla. And epinephrine is synthesized and stored primarily in the adrenal medulla. We refer from time to time to a pheochromocytoma, which is a pathology that's fairly rare among patients, but very common in board questions. And a pheochromocytoma is an epinephrine-releasing adrenal tumor. And we'll talk about that uh, during the discussion in class. Remember that systemic catecholamines do not cross the blood-brain barrier. And one term that we should clarify is the term sympathomimetics. These are drugs that act like catecholamines, but are not structurally related to catecholamines. So this will become important later on when we talk about different sympathomimetic drugs. This is a chart which I have reproduced in your notes, and you can find many versions of it in textbooks which looks at different tissues and describes the different receptors they have. We'll talk about receptors more in uh, a little bit later on. And then it clarifies how does that organ respond to an adrenergic or a sympathetic stimulus and to a cholinergic or a parasympathetic stimulus. So for example, the heart responds to a sympathetic stimulus with tachycardia and to a cholinergic stimulus with bradycardia. And this chart, which I find very helpful, summarizes the two systems and some of the similarities and differences between them. So this shows how the sympathetic system originates in the thoracolumbar region versus the cranial sacral region for the parasympathetic system. It describes where ganglia are typically located. It describes the fibers, the short preganglionic cholinergic versus the long preganglionic cholinergic fibers. This gets into neurotransmitters again, which we'll discuss a little bit later. And the, long, the longer versus the shorter postganglionic fibers. It discusses the ratio of pre to postganglionic fibers and other factors that describe these two systems. At this point, we will stop the recording and pick up again with the next recording to discuss in more detail.